if you asked him what he thought about philosophy, he'd have told you, I hate philosophy. And he wrote about that as well. He wrote about how philosophy was taught so much as just ideas on a page. And you'd have like, um, what was it that he said, uh, old, uh, I can't remember the exact quote, but something to the effect of uh, words attacking words attacking words. And that's all it really was for him. For love. It, wasn't, um, it wasn't productive, it wasn't useful, it wasn't practical. And so everything that he writes, he writes it as a, as, I mean, if he were alive today, we'd probably call him a self-help guru or something like that. We probably wouldn't even call him a philosopher. But if we called him a self-help guru, he'd probably attack us physically as well, because he hated that label also. <laughs> um, but yeah, he, he believed that philosophy should be practical. But anyway, his thinking is so incredibly original. It's one of those things where I, with, with students especially, I wish I could take like, the things I know about what was done before him, what was going on in the world when he was alive, and I wish I could just dump it into your head so that you could look at him and go, wow, that's quite phenomenal, what, what this guy came up with. Um, I like him a lot. I don't agree with a lot of what he says, but the fact that he came up with some of these ideas was, was incredible. Like, um, again, that statement, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. I've mentioned before, that comes from him. And he's very specific in that sense. He's saying what doesn't kill me makes me stronger, not what doesn't kill most people. You know, because it's not true that what, what doesn't kill most people makes them stronger. What doesn't kill most people makes us jaded, makes us bitter, resentful. Um, it doesn't leave us stronger in these ways. And so he's talking very specifically about himself, but it's, it's kind of worth, I don't know, um, maybe even worth pursuing to, to, to live a life this, this way. Because, as I've said, life is suffering. You're going to suffer in life. So you have that choice of whether we can be made better by it, stronger by it, or whether we can become bitter and jaded and, and so forth by it. Um, anyway, sorry, his, his, thing is, his thinking is so incredibly original to, to him that it's just, it's a, he's, so, he's so smart and scary, actually, when you read the stuff he writes. I mean, and I've told you before that he, he suffered from a neurological condition. We call them migraines, but they were really debilitating migraines. He couldn't write for more than 20 or 30 minutes or so at a time. So when he would write, it would have to be so, every sentence would have to be so deep, and, and I mean deep with meaning, because he couldn't write so, he couldn't write very much at a time. And this is a guy who went through a lot of suffering in his own life. And he went through a lot of suffering that was his own making. He brought suffering on himself in a lot of ways, which is true for most people. And we can, and I think that that's useful because we can look at him and say, "Well, yeah, but you know, this guy brought it on himself. He he put himself in this situation. He, you know, the guy was a, was a full professor, I think, at like 23 years old, something like that, which is incredibly young. Typically, you'll become a full professor like when you're in your mid 30s or so. And he was recognized in his, you know, by his peers as being so incredibly smart. And he did it for a couple of years, and he hated it because he said that the university had nothing to do with learning." That it was just people going and getting pieces of paper and degrees. They weren't really interested in that stuff. So he turned his back on it. And he essentially became unemployed. And he lived poor the rest of his life. And he could have lived very well as a university professor. Earned a lot of money. Been very, been stable, secure. But no, he wasn't seeking stability and security. Um, so you might say, well then he was stupid. Yeah, he brought that suffering on himself. That's true. And I guess the question is, what suffering are you bringing on yourself? Because we're all bringing suffering on ourselves by the things that we do. And it's so odd because we know usually ahead of time that we shouldn't be doing things, and yet we do do things. Um, what makes most of us feel happy leads us into harm, and yet we do it anyway. And there's a good question to ask ourselves, like, I'm sure some of you have done stupid shit in your life and been like, why do I do this? Why do I do this? And you're answering your own question. We do it because, will we be bored otherwise? So Nietzsche's uh, approach is he's saying, let's, let's embrace this. You know, you're, you're going to suffer in life, embrace the suffering. Um, it's very different from Frankel. Frankel, if you recall, um, you know, Man's Search for Meaning, he's telling us you're crazy if you can engage suffering, if you can avoid suffering and you don't avoid it. He's saying the suffering that you can't avoid, engage in it. But if you can avoid suffering, avoid it. Nietzsche is saying never turn your back on suffering because suffering is the thing that makes you better. And so if you, you know, if you only engage in, like, let's say, like one act, one, um, one, um, episode of suffering in your life, you've only got that one opportunity to become better. 
but if you engage in suffering every day of your life, and you allow it to make you stronger, you don't back off from it, you don't allow it to make you jaded or resentful or anything like that, well then, you're going to become better and stronger every single day. I was watching this, uh, if any of you guys have Netflix, oh, I think it's called Wild Babies. <laughs> well, it's interesting, she'll watch it. It's a dog, it's, it's a, I don't know if it's National Geographic or what it is, but it's one of those na nature ones, and they follow just like cubs, baby penguins, you know, baby monkeys, and the whole idea is about how they go from, from how old they, uh, from, from being born to finally becoming adults. And it's a relief when they name one of the one of the animals in there. Because what does it mean if they're going to name the animal? They're going to come back for it. Yeah, they're going to. Uh, oh, well, they're going to come back. Oh. Yeah. So in a, in, if, if there's a documentary and I say lion cub A is struggling to survive, what's going to happen to lion cub A? Dead. Dead. <laughs> but Shantu the cub. Now they've named it. So what's going to happen to this cub? Survive. survive. It's going to survive. Like oh, okay, they named it. <laughs> So then they'll, they, they, they track them, and you can see how the, the animals that are, that are there who engage in the, in the struggle are the ones that become better and stronger. So for example, there's this one where there's a, a lion cub, and um, she won't like, assert herself. So when something gets killed, she won't assert herself. She won't go in and like, get her portion of the food, and if she tries to, they'll like, chase her away. They'll like, growl at her and chase her away and all that. And then at one point, they show her she's like, laying in the shade, and, and they're saying she has to eat today. She's going to starve to death if she doesn't. And then that's 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 the, that suffering is enough so that when there is a kill, she, even though she's weak, even though she can't stand up for herself, she goes and does it anyway. And she, you know, one of the lions like roars at her, and she roars back at him, and she's dying. And she's like going over the pile of everybody to get into the I think it was a zebra or something like that that they, that they were eating. And it was just like okay. So then that's that struggle made her better. And then they cut to, the, to, to um, later on, like a couple days later, and they show her, she's like running around, she's playing with all the cubs, which she never did before. And then this big ass hippopotamus comes out of the water. Right. You know? And if you know about hippos, I mean, uh, it's, I think it's one of the, I think it's the leading cause of animal death in Africa. I mean, like, people are killed by, by a lot of uh, hippos. You know, we think they're so cute. Oh, hungry, hungry hippos. Yeah. Very hungry hippos. <laughs> <laughs> and they will kill you. And, 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 they, and you see them under the water, you just see like their faces, you know, their eyes. And then all of a sudden when they emerge completely, these things are enormous. So all the lion cubs are sitting on this beach, just kind of chilling. And this hippo comes out and starts coming out of the water, because the hippo doesn't want them that close to the water. So all the cubs start to back off, but this one cub, who's now learned how to assert herself, she stands up to the big giant right now, hippo. She stands no chance against this hippo. And it's actually a great reminder about, about nature. If her and all the other cubs and the lions, if they all jumped on this thing, they could kill it. And this thing is enormous. They could kill this thing, though. But they might lose a couple of them in the process. They might break a leg. And that's, of course, a death sentence where they are. So a lot of times you see these animals where they, they run away from a fight. And you, you might think, that, why? But you're, but you're a lion, but you're this. Because it would cost them a lot to get into that fight. It's just not worth it. So anyway, so she stands up to this big hippo, and the big hippo starts, and then because she does that, all the other cubs are like, well, she's going to do it, I guess we're with her, and they all stand up to the hippo also, and the hippo's not dissuaded, he wants them away. So he starts to approach them, and then she figures out, uh, some fights are not worth having. So she retreats and she leaves, all the other cubs follow her. So she's learning still that, you know, that, that there are those limits. Yes, you know, a couple days earlier, what was the limit? Everything. She, she couldn't even eat. She was barred from even that. She didn't even have the courage to eat. And then, in fact, for a few days, like, a hippo? Let's see what this thing's all about. <laughs> but then she also learns that's what it's about. Okay. So now she learns that there are perimeters. You know, once she busted through that first one, it's like, oh, sky's the limit. And she learns out, no, that's not the limit. This box is the limit. And as she gets bigger and so forth, she'll, she'll expand outside of there. But that's the same thing about all of us. That there are these limits that, that we impose on ourselves. And we stop ourselves from, from, from dreaming bigger or pursuing more. Or having the courage to, to go for something that normally, you know, if we want to go for it, but then we're kind of stopped by either our own minds or by social conventions or what people are going to think about us or we're afraid to take risks. And Nietzsche is saying that all of those are silly reasons not to go for something. Because if you go for something and you fail, what's the worst that happens? Well, you fail. You know, and, it's, and by the way, it's probably a good story later. 
you try, you, you go for something, and then afterwards it doesn't work out, at least it's a good story, like, oh my God, I can't believe I fill in the blank of whatever silly thing that you did. And then, but you learn from it, if you allow yourself to learn from it, you grow from it. You could instead not learn from it, be humiliated, and then be afraid to take another risk, to take, to take another chance. But that's the wrong way to see it, because that's not making you better, that's making you worse. The experiences in your life, you have to go through them anyway. So you may as well get better from them. You may as well grow from them. But that takes that takes a very it takes a very conscious and committed mind to be willing to do that. And my God, it's difficult. It's really hard. I mean, how many students have ever stood? I mean, how many students have sat in front of so many teachers over the eons? And the teachers who have said, you know, seize the day, make the most of it. And we all kind of go, yeah. Mm -hmm. And yet, look around the world, how many people actually do do that? The ones who do, a lot of we can name them. Elon Musk, Jack Dorsey, you know, Steve Jobs. We can name the people who, who, who really go for something, and then they succeed. And then if the people, the people who failed, at least they can walk away limping and go, well, I got a great story out of this. Which means in some way it was instructional, it was useful. So. Ideas. Those are the things that, that motivates me. Um, so there's this. So he's talking about this dichotomy between thinking and feeling. Thinking and feeling. Between intellect. Typically, he says, we draw this dichotomy. We separate these things out. This is a mistake. This is a mistake. What are some things that we would think about that would fall under like the thinking side? Times in your life when you should use your, 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 your reason, your, your intellect. School. School. You're about to say something in an argument. Especially if you're making points. When you're trying to like uh, make like your life like more convenient, like you know, like a situation. Just, like, We're trying to um, streamline something. Like, how can I make this more efficient? How can I make this better? On your feet, or how do you want to put that? Quick wit? Yeah, maybe. Or kind of like how to figure things out, almost like kind of like a puzzle. Like you don't know which goes where, but you kind of like figure it out. Puzzles. How about feeling and passion? What would we typically put over there? Sports. Sports. That's interesting. What else? Cooking. Cooking. Art. Mm -hmm. Philosophy. Well, if you ask Nietzsche, yeah. <laughs> Careers. Relationships. typically separate these things out and we'll say things like no no you gotta think with your head not with your heart you should bet with your head not with your heart like you know I, I know some of y'all are huge Padre fans but they're not going to win the World Series <laughs> you know you gotta know this you, know, you, you love it as much as you want but you've got to know that they're not going to win the World Series um, the Dodgers are supposed to win the World Series this year they're, they're ranked number one to win it I'm a huge Dodgers fan but one thing I I'm a lifelong Dodgers fan, which means I have a lifetime of Dodgers team that were supposed to win the World Series that failed miserably in doing so and let me down. <laughs> so I also will not bet on the Dodgers to win it this year. The one year I knew they would win it was the year that it was shortened because of COVID. And I said, they'll win that one because that's not a real championship. So that'll be the one time they actually do win it. 
So yeah, all these things, we, we separate them out. Now, when we, when we really kind of ponder it, think about ideas now, like specific ideas. Things like, um, I don't know, justice. Like what is justice? Um, mercy. Yeah. Someone with ever ideas, love, even. Is it empathy? Empathy. Empathy. All of these things here. We think of these almost as being kind of separated between the two. What I mean by that is this. Um, if we think about what, first off, what is justice? Right? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but I know it when I see it. <laughs> I don't know what justice is, but I sure know when I see it. It's very difficult for us to define what this is. And we might say it's like, oh, it's getting what you deserve. Well, if it's getting what we deserve, does anybody in here want justice? No, I would say justice is, justice is something... Justice is where two people get a part of what they want. Hmm. So if we cut a cheeseburger in half, that's justice? I mean, so. In a way. If we cut a cheeseburger... Two thirds me, one third you. Is that justice? Mm -hmm. But we're both getting a part of what we want. I'm just getting more of what I want. I guess it is. It's hard. <laughs> no, it is a hard thing, and I, and I know that throughout the year I, I drop these things on you, or I'll be like, "Okay, what's love? Give me a definition, quick." If <laughs> <laughs> you haven't thought about it, it's hard to come up with stuff like this. And any of you guys who do come up with ideas on the fly like that, and it isn't just that you're participating. It, it's, it's something much deeper than that. The fact that you can come up with something that quick. I mean, when I ask you something like, what is justice? I, I've been studying this for, for, for 20 years as a student. So I should have some ideas of what this is and what this is and what this is and what this is. But if you've never, I mean, if this is like the first time you're being asked to think about these things, it's actually quite incredible that you can come up with anything at all. You know, even something like this. And then that's how we find out, well, let me sharpen this. Because you, we seem to have an intuitive idea of what justice is. We just don't know how to define it or how to explain it. That's why I said only half jokingly, I, don't, I couldn't tell you what justice is, but I know it when I see it. Because th that's the same with most of us. We probably, you know, if I ask you, is this a just case? Most of us could probably say yes or no, and we'd be on the same page for the most part. But if I ask you to explain what's just about it, well, that, that's where it becomes difficult. So what Nietzsche is saying here is that all of these things here, yeah, thinking and intellect, these are the things you have to have in school. Um, Show of hands, how many of y'all really want to be here? Yeah. The hands start to go up and they <laughs> collapse. And even like on a normal day, even on a normal day, it's one of the reasons like when my students ask me why I, why I decided to teach here instead of at the college. Because for a while I taught full time at here and I, and I taught at the college. And the reason I, I, I just couldn't do it anymore because you're t I'm teaching 10 classes. That's a lot of classes to be teaching. Um, you can imagine what the grading looks like, you know, <laughs> as it is right now with only five classes. Um, but I just couldn't do it anymore. It was too exhausting. I did it for a couple of years, a few years actually. You know, I, was, you know, I had to make a decision whether it be here or whether to be over there. And I chose here because this is, well, it's a hell of a lot of fun. And over there, it's really easy. You know, at the college, it's really easy. And when you, when you go to, the, you know, when I teach over there, it looks like every desk is full. Everyone's looking straight forward. Everyone's sitting there taking notes. Everyone's asking a ton of questions. I got people even sitting in the aisles because there aren't enough desks for people to sit. And everybody who's taking the class signed up for it. They want to be there. And then they also they hear about other other professors. Like hey, we're seeing last class time, rate my professor. Yeah. There's a website where you can go and rate, rate your professors. I've never looked at mine. <laughs> you know, saying, oh, it's either going to be really good, in which case my head's just going to go and it won't fit through the door anymore. <laughs> Or my rate my professor is terrible, which is going to break my heart, because I try really hard. So I don't even know, I don't, I don't know my set. But you can go up there and you can, you can see how others, you know, what other students think about teachers, and then you can you know, set up those classes. So when your classes start getting full, it means that they say very nice things about you. So I, um, I, I, well, I'll just say it's very easy. Everybody who's in that room wants to be in that room. Everybody who's in that room is expecting it. Everyone's pursuing a degree. They're actually paying to be there. That's really easy. When I walk in here, I look around the room, there's like 38 students, and I'm like, let's see, so I've got like four, probably, who are paying attention right now. <laughs> you know, everybody else is doing other things, their minds are in other places, they have all these other terrible things going on in life. You know, then, you know, start to realize that if you, if you want to be somewhere, that's how you're really going to learn. 
if you want to be in this class, you'll learn. And that doesn't mean like, you know, maybe you were put into this class, but even you can, you can still have to be here, which of course you don't have to be here, but you know what I'm saying. You're still going to have a positive idea, a positive sense about the, about the place, so you're going to get a lot out of it. So there is a certain level of, of want that's attached to this. Which of course, want belongs to, to feeling and, and passion. And with regards to sports, what well, we talked earlier in the, in the school year about how you can be an intellect in, 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 in all sports in all areas. So there is some interchange back and forth. Um, cooking is, is, is largely you know, measurements and stuff like that, so there is a lot of thinking that goes into it. But if you're like me, I just, I just feel my way through it. <laughs> I let the gods guide me. But some of you, no, I don't think I talked to you guys about it. I made some fried rice a few weeks ago, and I just dumped it out of my, out of my refrigerator like two days ago, because the, the recipe called for, for two cloves of garlic. And I'm like, oh, I gotta feel my way through this. So I dumped five cloves of garlic oh. in there. No. It was too much, even for me, and I like garlic. I, and I, I still tried to power my way through it, but I just, I couldn't do it. So I ended up tossing the last of it. I'm like, I just can't get through it. So, uh, you know, so there is a certain level of thinking and, and that goes into, of course, and the feeling and passion. Art, you have to, yeah, there's feeling, but you also have to have the technical skill to be able to, to, to execute what you're imagining, what you're thinking about. Um, your arguments, I mean, what are we arguing about? Whatever it is that we're arguing about, you're, you have a desire to be right. It's that desire to be right that then forces you to engage your intellect and your thinking. You know, even if you're thinking of something like, well, justice, we want justice, but that want for justice is an emotional thing. You wouldn't want a judge on the, on the bench who didn't care about justice one way or the other, because they were indifferent. You'd want one who was passionate about justice. Same is true about mercy and love and empathy. So empathy makes sense, but you have to feel it. So, what Nietzsche is getting at here is that all of these things, they're back and forth, and that the more that you can engage all of your mind, all of who you are, the better you're going to be in all of these things. In other words, let, your, let your, your, your passions tell you what you want in life, let your intellect guide you to get there. And then let your, let your intellect also kind of temper this, because your, your, your passions might say, I want, to, I want to learn how to fly, but not the conventional way like in an airplane. I want to learn how to fly like without any help at all. <laughs> so I'm going to jump out of an airplane with no parachute and I believe in myself. Hopefully your intellect takes over at that point and says don't jump out of an airplane with no parachute. You'll fly for a little while <laughs> but that's about it. You're going, to, you're going to fall for most of it. So then your intellect will go okay yeah yeah I guess you're right. But maybe if I jumped out of an airplane like a paragliding suit, maybe that would be better. Yeah, okay, but you have to figure out how to make that work. But it's all guided and directed by this. The problem is that we separate these things out and we downplay this a lot. You know, this is the stuff right here that makes life worth living. It isn't the intellect that makes life worth living. Intellect is the thing that makes life possible. But this is the thing that makes life worth living. I mean, even, and, and, and the, the, even the interplay between the two is really funny. Like sometimes you'll do something really stupid in life because you just wanted to, you know, your pursuit of passion or whatever, and then it, it failed, and then afterwards you sit there and go, I can't believe I tried that. I can't believe I went for that. What made me think that that would have been a possibility? I mean, I even think about, like, I think I told you guys a story that when I was in high school, we used to go truck surfing, which was you get a pickup truck, and we'd go to the top of the Hollywood Hills, and my friend would drive his truck down the hills, and it was very windy, and then you would stand in the back of the pickup truck, and we would compete to see who could stay standing the longest. But we weren't stupid about it. We had people in the back of the pickup who were, whose job it was, was to catch you if you fell out. So we, we thought this through. <laughs> now, how deeply did we think this through? Not particularly, man. Because life ain't like movies, where if someone's falling out of the truck, you reach out one hand, you grab hand to hand, and you pull them like over a cliff. That's not the way real life works. The real, way that real life works is when someone falls out of a truck, you go... <laughs> <laughs> so my friend fell out of the truck, and I remember we, we slammed on the brakes, and we're looking out the back, I was in the cab at the time, and we see him sitting in the middle of the street, underneath a street lamp, and his arm is now an L. Oh. Oh. And he's sitting in the middle of the street, on his butt, just <laughs> examining this thing. <laughs> and so we get out, we run over there, and we're looking at him, and he just goes, I 
think it's broken. Fucking <laughs> thing is poking out, there's blood everywhere. He's like, I think it's broken. And then my friend was like, I don't know, man, I'm sure it's not a sprain. <laughs> I don't know which one he was working with on that. So my friend's mom, who that happened to, she was like a nurse's, a nurse or a nurse's assistant, something like that in the medical field. So we, so we drove him home and we thought, well, shit, we can't tell everybody what happened. Um, and fortunately, he's still in shock, the adrenaline's still going. So we're like, one guy among our peer group was like, well, one of our friends said, well, can we just put it back? Like, can we put the thing back? <laughs> so well, I was like, well, I don't know, I mean, is that possible? Not a lot of this going on. What's guiding us? The fact that we didn't want to get caught. So now we're trying to engage the intellect so that we don't get caught. And so we came up with this brilliant plan where we take him home, we sneak him into his house, and then he waits like 15 minutes or so after we leave, and then he falls out of his bed, hits the floor, making a loud noise, and then he can yell. Like, ow! And then his mother will come in, see that he has broken his arm by falling a foot and a half to the floor. <laughs> so we just thought, this is a brilliant plan. You know, we should be... We should all become generals in the army. We've come up with some great <laughs> tactics here. So we do that. We drop them off at home. We all go home. And the next morning, my friend's mom calls me. She goes, what did you do? I'm like, what, what do you mean, what did I do? I don't know. What's going Who is this? <laughs> and she, she said, you know who this is. She said, what did you guys do last night? And I'm like, uh, well, we went to hung out at the mall and then dropped him off. She's like, no, he's telling His arm was, was, sh was shattered. He had a compound fracture. And he's trying to tell us that he fell out of the bed. She's all, that's stupid. So the only person who could come up with that would have been you. <laughs> but I didn't come up with it. wasn't even my idea. So I was like, oh. So I get honestly sit there, like, you know, clutching my pearls. I did not. What are you talking about? But I could see why she would say that. You know, because it was just, we get a bunch of idiots together. And we're, we didn't engage our intellect very properly. We were just trying not to get caught. And so afterwards, we're sitting there, and we're thinking like, oh my god, I can't believe we tried to pull that off. That was so stupid. <laughs> But it's a funny story, I'm still telling it 20 years later, you know? So Nietzsche is saying he's a guy who thinks in such a way that the separation between all of these things has disappeared. That he engages his whole mind, his whole personality, his whole intellect in everything that he pursues. He pursues everything as an entire person, a whole person. Not separated out. He's not living as half of a person, but he's living as a whole person. He engages all of it. And that's, that's a healthy way to live. It's difficult. It's difficult. Because that means that all of your ideas are, are, are tied to your, to your emotions. And all of your emotions are therefore, of course, regulated by your ideas. And so there's a tension there. It forces you to work things out. But if you do work it out, you say, it will be worth it. So, questions, comments, concerns, complaints, criticisms, critiques?